All right, so in the last short video, we started to discuss event-related potentials and how event-related potentials can be used to isolate brain activity. So the problem is that EEG reflects the sum total of all brain activity in your head at any one time. And we're not generally interested in that. What we tend to be interested in is discrete brain activity associated with a particular cognitive task or a particular brain process. So how do we isolate specific mechanisms the activity associated with specific mechanisms in the brain from this ongoing EEG. And event-related potentials are one way to do that. Now, the premise of event-related potentials is very, very simple. And it's just simply that we record EEG. So this is ongoing EEG from an electrode position on the brain space, on the, on the scalp here. We have this EEG that, it, that is an ongoing signal. And we just simply have some sort of event that occurs with at discrete temporal intervals. So here we're talking about a sound generator. This would be just something going beep, beep, beep. And what we do is we time lock the ongoing EEG around the moment of stimulus onset. So we look at the EEG immediately surrounding the moment of stimulus onset. We do that for many, many uh, trials. So say 100 trials, we have these individual events occur and the EEG uh, that surrounds those events. We average across all of those individual trials and by averaging in this way, any of the brain activity in this EEG signal that's not associated with the stimulus of interest, the stimulus that we're time locking to, that can all be considered random. The rest of the EEG that's not associated with stimulus processing can as much be up or down at any individual point in the EEG. So you thinking about your grandmother or the fact that you're hungry for lunch, all of those things don't stay consistently associated with the onset of this stimulus. And so they average out. And what we end up with is, is known as an event-related potential. And the event-related potential, when the stim onsets, what you see is that the event-related potential shows potential, shows electrical activity in the brain space that's been created by the onset of this stimulus. So it is an event-related potential because there is an event, the stimulus onset, and we're looking at the potential, the brain activity, that's associated with that event, that's related to that event. So here is an example of what this sort of looks like. Here, the blue line is the ongoing average of the brown lines. And what we're looking at is a auditory ERP experiment where there are noises that are standard noises and oddball noises. And that would sound something like this. Beep, 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 boop, beep, 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 boop. What we find is that the standard response, do you like my beeps and boops? The standard response has a particular morphology looks a particular way and the oddball response looks a little bit different because it's uncommon and you get this sort of uh, slightly increased processing for the less frequent stimulus. Again these brown lines are the ongoing EEG they're being cut up for these individual trials we're getting an accumulation of trials here and the blue line is the average of the ongoing brown lines so it's the accumulation the accumulating average of the brown lines and what you tend to find is that the standard response here has a relatively shallow P3 component and about this latency through here, you'll see that there's this accumulation of positive potential that occurs right around this latency here that's relatively small and much larger for these oddball stimuli, right? So we're seeing that there's now a difference between the evoked responses for the standard stimuli versus the oddball stimuli. And we're, we're identifying that discrete event-related activity associated with the processing of standard stimuli, the processing of oddball stimuli, simply by averaging across individual trials to get rid of the noise in the EEG and leave only this evoked response, this event-related response. So let's have one clinical example of a use for an auditory event-related potential. Uh, multiple sclerosis is, is an inflammation that causes demyelinization of axons. And some of you may be familiar with this, but you remember from uh, psychobiology modules in the past, right? That there is, that the axon is covered in these little pockets of fat, these myelin sheaths, right? And they speed up the action potential. I won't get into the details of that, but what happens in multiple sclerosis is that these myelin, these fat sheaths, these, these little bundles of fat, they start to degrade and that slows down the action potential because the purpose of these little, these little bits of fat is to kind of speed up the transfer of uh, electrical potential down the axon. So when these start to degrade, then it slows down the signal processing of the brain. And this really messes things up, which is why multiple sclerosis is such a horrible disease. Um, so multiple sclerosis is associated with the demyelinization of axons, causes neural transmission to slow down. This has associated cognitive deficits. I won't get into the details of those. 
visual and auditory evoked potentials can index this problem, and they're used as a, a means of diagnosing MS. Um, the idea here is that if you find that visual and evoked activity, visual and auditory evoked activity in the brain, shows slowing, this is a, a, a strong diagnostic tool that suggests that uh, the symptomology is associated with the onset of MS. So what we end up seeing, we might do something that's a, 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 a similar sort of task to what we saw previously, where you have a standard stimuli and oddball stimuli. You get a, a particular component of brain activity that's known as the mismatch negativity. So when something doesn't fit the ongoing context, so with the beeps and the boops example, if you get a boop that doesn't fit the context of the ongoing uh, uh, um, stimulation, then you see this, this MMN emerge, right? So you see here that you have standard stimuli and deviant stimuli. The standard stimuli have a particular pattern. The deviant stimuli and the thinner line have a particular pattern. There is a difference between them and around this sort of latency that, that identifies the, the mismatch negativity, the auditory mismatch negativity. And if we look at MS patients, we see that this MMN activity is not nearly as large as in normal controls. So we're seeing a reduction of this, this uh, uh, response to oddball stimuli that's associated with degradation of the myelinization of the axons. So this would be used as a diagnostic tool alongside other um, symptom, symptoms of MS uh, if the ERPs came back with this difference, this, this reduction of the, the MMN response in the ERPs. This is a strong um, uh, diagnostic tool suggesting uh, um, that the, the, the patient has MS. Okay, so let's talk about some research applications for ERPs. Um, so again, we're looking at sensory evoked activity, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about visual ERPs. Same sort of premise, right? So we have somebody here who's viewing things on a computer screen, and we're going to take the ongoing EEG and cut it up around the visual events that occur on the computer screen. So here is an example of a visual oddball task. So in contrast to the auditory oddball task we were just talking about a moment ago, now we have a, a screen on the computer that's uh, creating stimulation. We're recording EEG from headspace. And we have X's and O's that appear visually, right? So X's can appear on the computer screen or O's can appear on the computer screen. The O's are less common than the X's. We have this ongoing EEG signal that we're recording while the, the participant sits and views the, the visual stimulation. And we cut that EEG up into epochs, uh, reflecting the stimulus event of interest, the events of interest. Now, when we contrast the average of all the stimulus events when the stimulus was an X against the average of all the stimulus events when the event was an, an, an O, we will see that there are differences in the evoked activity. So if we average 80 Xs, the event-related potential has this morphology that looks like this. So we get a P1N1. These, these are the, the waves, the, um, the components of the ERP, these deflections in the ERP are stereotyped and emerge in individuals very consistently. And so they have names, the first positive component, the, the first negative component, the first, uh, the second positive component, the second negative component, et cetera, et cetera. If we look at an average of 80 X's, an average of 20 O's, we find that there is a much larger positive response beginning at about 300 milliseconds or, or so, which is known as the third positive component in the ERP. So there's this much larger P3 component when you, for these oddball visual stimuli versus these standard visual stimuli. Right? And here we just have sort of an example of the fact that we're cutting up. So these are the EEG segments around the markers. So this is cutting up the EEG to reflect these X's and O's. And if we average across 80 X's, we get this sort of a pattern. If we average across 20 O's, we get a different pattern. And the 20 O's has a larger P3 component because it is an oddball stimulus. So there, it's evoking some sort of enhanced activity because it is less common. Here is another example of that, right? Um, so now we're looking at a visual event-related potential. This is just another illustration of how we signal average to create the event-related potential. Again, the brown lines are individual EEG for a trial. The blue line is the event-related potential. And you can see as more and more trials accumulate, you start to have this stereotyped uh, pattern of responses in the EEG where you have a first positive component at around 100 milliseconds etc etc so you start to see this shape emerge that is quite a consistent shape so signal averaging allows us really to identify this standard activity in the brain 
The ERP for individuals doesn't always look the same. So I just wanted to quickly sort of uh, uh, um, exemplify this, that if you have a set of evoked uh, visual responses for different individuals, because their heads are different, because their brains are different, because their skulls are thicker, because you recorded it at different times, um, the ERP itself can be different for different individuals. So this subject does not have a very prominent N1 component, and this subject has a massive N1 component. So there's a difference between these two individuals. This subject's skull might simply be thicker than this subject's skull, and therefore we're just getting a, an attenuated signal for this subject. So people look different from one another, but people tend to look the same if you record on different sessions. So this is subject six. In session one, we see that the, the morphology of this ERP looks very much like it did at different sessions at different times. So there's lots of individual variability, but not very much temporal variability. These are quite stable responses over time if you actually fit the electrode back to the same location. And so it has this sort of standard, again, this standard morphology of P1, N1, P2, N2, P3. The P1 is the first big visual component and it's positive polarity. It occurs at around 100 milliseconds, maybe 90 milliseconds in some cases, a little bit faster than 100 milliseconds, and it reflects early activity in extra striate cortex. It's the really onset of visual uh, perceptual processing. So when visual cortex starts to become very strongly activated by input, you see the emergence of this P1. There is activity that precedes this. The first discernible activity in the ERP uh, visual activity that you can identify occurs at about 60 milliseconds and we refer to it actually as the C1. It's not illustrated here for, for reasons I won't get into. So the first real evidence of visual activity actually precedes the P1, but it's smaller in magnitude. The P1 reflects this first big feed forward activation of visual cortex. So it's kind of reflecting visual areas like V2 and V3, uh, lateral occipital cortex higher level uh, visual cortex as, as activity sort of feeds out of the calcarine fissure where the primary visual cortex is and sort of starts to spread across lateral visual cortex. You subsequently have the P2 and the N2 components, so these sort of components that follow the P1N1 complex. And P2 activity is reflecting extra stride cortex in the visual ERP, higher visual areas. It's starting to reflect reentrance that you're getting communication between visual areas and these reentrant loops. Subsequently, you have the N2 and the P3, and this is very high-level cognitive processes. We're now looking at three to four to 500 milliseconds after the stimulus event has occurred, and we're seeing really evidence of the brain becoming active in a very large way to this visual event, reflecting all kinds of cognitive processes. There are other components that are not, uh, so let's talk about some other event-related potential components that are not necessarily visually evoked uh, activity, but we're now talking about higher level cognitive processes and specifically we're going to talk about some novelty induced components we've talked about the mmn already a little bit uh, we'll talk a bit more here about the p3 so that we see if we get this again this accumulation of activity again the brown lines are ongoing eeg the blue line is the accumulation of the event related potential this is again for standard and oddball stimuli as before and you see this emergence of a difference, right? The P3 is smaller here than it is here. It's much larger and more positive here. So we're seeing a difference in brain activity uh, as a function of the standard versus oddball here. Uh, this comes uh, for visual stimuli as much as it does auditory stimuli. So you can have experiments where you have visual oddballs, so stimuli that sort of are novel among ongoing uh, repetitions of images. You'll see this same sort of activation. So we can see that here where we have simply repeated standard versus oddball visual stimuli. If we look at uh, the brain activity, we'll see that there is this substantive difference in the N2 component and in the P2 component, right? So simply repeated standard stimuli, you're getting a different pattern. When you have a uh, change to novel, you get the emergence of this N2 component followed by this large P3 component, component as compared to this uh, standard stimulus. So something's going on here at a beginning of about 200 milliseconds where your brain's recognizing that something has changed, right? You've had this, this in the context of this repeated stimulation, you've had this change from repetition to a novel stimulus. The P3, the, the, this P3 response, this novelty P3, it can be separated into two subparts. 
you have the P3A and the P3B, and I won't get, uh, we'll talk a bit more about this in, uh, below here, but this, as well as that novelty N2, these can be evoked with equal amplitude based on input in any sensory channel. So it can be auditory input, it can be tactile input, it can be uh, visual input. Um, any of these sensory channels will all produce the same sort of pattern of a novelty N2 P3 complex. And the idea here is that whatever is happening there is a cognitive process that is not linked to sensory processing or perception. This is something that is abstracted from the sensation, from the modality of sensation. This N2 component, it's uh, the second negative wave. It peaks at about 200 milliseconds. We're talking about activity in medial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate and surrounding areas. It's smaller when stimuli match the immediate memory trace and increases when there's a mismatch between the context, the environmental context, and the current stimulation. Uh, the P3A is a little bit later at about 250 milliseconds. It rapidly habituates when you repeat stimuli. It's independent from the N2. It's got a different source in brain space. It's more parietal cortex. And it has been linked in the past to the focusing of attention on novel stimuli. And then you subsequently have the P3B, which is the largest positive deflection in this sort of context. It begins at about 300 milliseconds, lasts a very long time, and it's only elicited when there's something that's behaviorally relevant or that you need to remember something about this oddball stimulus. Talk about a few other event-related potential components, some motor components, the lateralized readiness potential, and the contingent negative variation. The lateralized readiness potential has another German name, the Breitschaft's potential. Um, don't worry about that. The LRP uh, is, is these two both refer to the same brain activity. It's just as the first reported by Germans and therefore often uh, re referred to with its German name. The CNV is this sort of very large deflection frontally over uh, over prefrontal cortex. It's an increase in activity over prefrontal cortex and over motor cortex. When you are warned that you are going to have to perform some sort of task. So if I tell you that in, in, I give you a warning signal that you're subsequently going to have to press the space bar on the computer, you will see this contingent negative variation where prefrontal all the way up back to motor cortex becomes increasingly active as you become closer and closer to the moment in time where you're going to have to make some sort of response. The lateralized readiness potential is, is similar to the CNV, but it's specific to the, the brain area that needs to initiate the movement. So if I tell you that you're going to have to uh, press the space bar with your left hand, what I can find is that the activity over right visual cort or sorry, right motor cortex, which is responsible for creating the action in your left hand, will start to show this onset of activity after the warning signal. So we can actually identify that, that you're preparing to make a specific action with your left hand. There are other uh, event-related potentials associated with the processing of error or reward. So response error-related negativity, feedback error-related negativity, the medial frontal negativity. These are all related event-related potential components that are associated with activation of anterior cingulate cortex and that are associated with making errors or, or receiving rewards or failing to gain rewards. The ERN is elicited in response to an error, so it just really reflects the brain process that recognizes that you've made a mistake. So you can imagine that if you're making a difficult discrimination task, where you have to quickly report whether a degraded image is a warm-blooded or cold-blooded animal, you're going to make mistakes. And when you make mistakes in this case, right, when you make a, a correct response versus an incorrect response, what we find is that immediately around the moment that you make the response, so this is an ERP that is a time locked to the, the, mate, the, the response that you actually make, you find that when you make an incorrect response, there is this deflection in the ERP that does not emerge as prominently when you make a correct response. And so this negative going potential is associated with the activation of anterior cingulate cortex, which is up at the front medial surface of the brain, that seems to be associated with the recognition of error, the signaling of need to kind of pay more attention to what you're doing. You get this same ERN type activity when you're told whether or not you've completed a task correctly. So when you get feedback about the task, if you're told that you've done it correctly, there is no deflection. If you're told that you've made an error, you see the same sort of activity emerge in brain space from the same underlying generators, the same brain areas. So this error-related negativity is a very interesting tool 
uh, that allows you to investigate the brain's uh, updating response when there is recognition of an error, uh, of commission of an error. Interestingly, the ERN begins often even before you actually make a physical response. So if you're trying to do a very, very quick task, you often know that you're making the mistake even before you actually physically make that mistake. Because of course, your brain has to do all sorts of programming uh, to create that response and that takes time. So you may send a signal in the brain saying, okay, I, I want to press my left hand. And by the time your left hand's actually pressing the button, you've already realized that that's an error. So you can see that the, the ERN actually emerges prior to the response in some cases. You get very similar activation of the same sort of brain area, the same sort of medial frontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, uh, when you're given reward feedback. Um, and so it really seems that, that this brain area is really uh, associating the outcome of actions and the value of actions in some sort of way to guide future behavior. So that you get this response ERN, which has this sort of locus coming from anterior cingulate cortex, you get that same sort of activation when participants are told that they have made money or lost money. When they're told that they're, they're going to lose money, you get this same sort of activation of this area that seems to really signal uh, to the overall cognitive system that something's gone wrong and you best pay attention and figure out why it's going wrong. So this general anterior cingulate system seems to be comparing outcomes with expectations. This is one interpretation of this system. And it becomes actum, active when there's a mismatch between your expectations and the actual outcome. So it might be detecting conflict as such, right? As when two motor responses are concurrently activated or when you have an expectation that conflicts with the reality. All right, thank you very much.